experience working for uh, large debt arts organizations, and by debt I mean millions of dollars in debt. Uh, I've worked in behemoth nonprofit shops, uh, UW Medicine, where we had 50 or 60 on staff, to little teeny tiny ones where there's one or two of us in there and, and have uh, helped some nonprofits do a lot of turnarounds and that sort of thing. So I'm going to um, talk a little bit about each of those areas. So hopefully, no matter where you work or what size your organization is, you'll be able to take something away from it. I know that's always a, a challenge at conferences, is being able to take something back and, and apply it in your shop. So. Um, on the agenda side of the house, I'll, I'll walk everybody through development at the Blood Center and, and what it's been like there. I've been there uh, just under a year, but I can provide everyone some background and knowledge as what we came into and, and what we've done there. Um, from a lack of data, data all over the place, small donor base, and that sort of thing. Um, we'll talk about actionable intelligence versus data. So how to kind of actually uh, provide the fundraisers with what they need so that they can succeed in doing their jobs. And, and that's where I'm sure you all have the best impact in, in your work. And then the delivery of that. And so I think probably one of the most frustrating things when it comes to information and data is we pull reports and do some prospecting work and we hand that over and we come back in a month and it's still sitting there on the desk collecting dust and nobody's done anything. So hopefully we can talk about some ideas there, how to, how to move that forward. Um, I'll leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A so that um, I'm sure a number of you will have specific questions about maybe what you're encountering there and we can, we can share with the group and that sort of thing. So um, with no further ado, so Puget Sound Blood Center. Um, we're a good size organization as far as nonprofits go. So we have a, we're a $160 million organization. We have 1,000 employees. We're in 17 locations throughout Western Washington. Um, although I've kind of termed us as we're like the FBI. So when we're doing our jobs well, nobody really reads about it or hears about us or anything, which is a downfall. Of course, we want everyone to know what's there. And of course, if we ever screw up, it's front page headlines and that sort of stuff. So we want to stay out of there. Um, I've been there uh, under a year, just under a year. Um, but a quick summary of what we kind of face starting this off. So uh, the development shop's about 10 years old at the Blood Center, and it's what I would call kind of static fundraising. So 10 years ago it raised X amount of money. Every year since then it's raised about the same amount of money. They've poured a lot of uh, resources into community awareness campaigns and marketing campaigns, feasibility studies, yet year in and year out it's just kind of a flat line. Um, everything there has been needs-based. So each year they come out and say, boy, our vehicles are broken down this year. We need a blood mobile, and, and we need you to help us fund this. And then the following year they do the same thing, and it's, well, now we need a flow cytometer. And now we need you to help us do this for our research institute. So it's always what we need, what we need, and not what are you interested in, where are your passions, and that sort of thing. Um, Events-based, so most of the money that they raised came through numerous events. They had athletic events, which are swims, golf tournaments, big galas, all that kind of stuff. So that's how they went about it. And then the constituency base is, is backwards. So the primary funding source for the blood center is corporations, and second is foundations, and third is individuals, which is complete opposite from the, the, the national base, which says 81% of philanthropy comes from people, 15% from foundations and 4% from corporations. So they're doing it in the most inefficient manner through events, or I should say we do it, no, I work there. We're doing it through <laughs> the most inefficient manner through events, and we're, we're putting all of our time and resources into the smallest portion of the pie. So things needed to change, um, which is why I assume I, they hired me. Um, so when I started there, we grabbed the development team of three that were there, and we sat down and said, all right, we're going to start at the top, work our way down. Somebody give me a list of our biggest donors, and, and let's start there. So here's our biggest donor, and what do we, you know, why are they supporting a the blood center? And the development team said, oh my god, they love us, they're so fantastic, and they give us tons of money every year, and they come to all our events, and they volunteer, great, why are they supporting the blood center? 
and just get that blank look. And like, All right, well, well, we'll come back to that. Let's go to the next one. So why does this person support? Oh, they love us and they come to events and volunteer and it's great and they've toured and da 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 and they give us a gift and it's just fantastic. Why do they support the Lutzen? And I just get that blank look again. And so I'm like, all right, well, this isn't going to work. We're two donors and top donors and we haven't gotten anywhere. So we're going to switch tactics and start to look at more of the data side of the house and what's in there. So um, looking through the data, the data was scattered. We use Razor's Edge. I don't know if anybody has that. Huh? The data is scattered through the system. Um, so we have a Navy Admiral who's a big donor to the Puget Sound Blood Center. And the fact that he was an Admiral in the Navy was in the biographical tab in Razor's Edge, which is exactly where it should be. That's what we're looking for. He, it's part of his body. Um, we went to the action tab, and there it is in the action tab saying this person was an admiral in the Navy and served 20 years and da, 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 da. And then I even go in the notes section, and there's a note saying, hey, this person's an admiral in the Navy. And da, 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 da. So um, as, as you all, as professionals of what you do, know crap in, crap out. So uh, it makes it really difficult there for us to pull reports with any kind of uh, information, useful information. Um, due to it just being scattered and repetitive. So obviously we needed a new system. Um, what challenged us also with that is about every two to three years, somebody new would come in and change all the coding. <laughs> so we could pull reports up through about 2004 in a certain kind of a format, then stop, then reports from 04 to 08 in a certain kind of format and stop then 08 to 2010 and stop, and then of course I come on board and I'm like, oh, we, we need a whole new system because mine's the best now. Uh, so that part has created a challenge for us too. Um, so we got together, figured out what we needed, and created a whole new coding system based on what the fundraisers needed. Um, and it's not, I'm not up here to say it was rocket science. We put the bio information in the bio codes and the event information in the event codes, you know, the, the simple stuff like that. One thing we did do is we shut off all of the codes that were already in the system. So we didn't delete them, we didn't edit them because we do want that historical information that's in there. But we turned them off and started with a whole new way to launch our fiscal year. Um, let's see, so those codes that we did, we focused on six key areas of the donor information. So family values, careers, advisors, assets, and motivations. And, uh, this is the area and all of the coding and structure in the system we focused around this because this is what we as fundraisers want to focus on. Um, and now that we've got this in here, it's very easy for us to pull reports on this information. And if we don't have data on somebody, for instance, if we don't have any career information on them, that portion of whatever the bio report that we're pulling shows up blank. So it makes it really easy and simple for the fundraiser there to know what the next step is for me with this donor, whether it's a phone call, visit, I'm at an event or anything, I need to find out what the career information is so that we can fill this in. It's, it's hard for us as fundraisers to come up with strategies. I should say it can be hard for us if we don't have this type of information about the people. Now that we've got that in the system, uh, it's, it's really simple for us to help to utilize board members and committee members also with this sort of thing. So we had an event uh, last Wednesday, our big annual donor stewardship event, and we had a board member separated at each table. Every board member got bio sheets of who's at their table, and here's the stuff we know about them. And if we didn't have family and career things, then it was, Bob, your job tonight during dinner is to find out information about their career and their family and then you report that back to us. So we have seven people in our development shop at the moment, but that night we had about 30 of us in the audience helping work and, and, and get that information in. And it made it really easy for the board members and committee members that we had on the sheet that said, if it's blank, that's the information we need that night. Um, we're doing some follow-up now. Some were better at it than others, but you know, life lessons as we go. Um, we also uh, utilize, I've been using these for probably eight or ten years in different formats, a, a strategy worksheet um, with the fundraising team um, that they fill out. And, you know, if you want copies of this, I'm sure you can get an email on this. Um, but it, it talks about the background of the donor, what's, what's happened today, and again, here's these six areas. So we use these in our team meetings, and we can focus on people where someone says, 
oh, I don't know what to do with this Navy Admiral person. And we can say, well, all we know is he was in the Navy, so we need this bit of information. So give him a call, go visit, fill that out, and it helps us to start to put those strategies in place. Um, Um, I'm going to go over just summary stuff like those six areas in each of these topics because I know we don't have time to go too deep, but we can always follow up afterwards. Um, so next on the actionable intelligence side of the house. Um, I served in the military for a number of years overseas, and as you can imagine, we relied on a lot of intelligence from various agencies to tell us what's happening and, and taking place out there. They would feed us information on on political discussions that are taking place, uprisings, and, and uh, maybe change in leadership and that kind of stuff. But it, it wasn't, while it may have been good for somebody in DC, I wouldn't say it was the best for the boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, to, to help us do our jobs. Um, and I remember there was a, a, a bombing at Air Force Barracks in Dahran. We felt it. And we were calling, trying to get information about it, and couldn't do it. And no joke, we got more information from CNN that night than we did from the intelligence group. Because they said, oh, it was a gas truck, and this is what happened. So now we go pay attention to that, to that gas truck that was out there. And so this is what I would, this kind of data is what I would term more as kind of intellectual than actionable. And um, similarly, I had a prospect researcher once. Excuse me, my throat's right. Um, deliver me a, a donor prospect and said, oh, they're, they're a doctor, they're in California, he's created several patents, um, he's got a great lifestyle, home on the beach at Southern California, life is great, and you work at a medical school, so there you go. And so in the back of my head, I thought, well, I don't know, what the hell am I going to do with this prospect? I can imagine that phone call of, hi, I'm Mike, and you have a lot of patents, and you're a doctor, and I went to a school you didn't go to, but I'd love to talk to you about uh, what we're doing up here, and, and I can just imagine how fast he'd hang up that phone and that sort of thing. So again, it, it wasn't necessarily actionable intelligence. Um, so the moral of that story there is to you know make sure that there's some information there that the fundraisers can use. So I, I'm not up here saying, it's your guys' job to provide all this information and come up with all the strategies and that kind of stuff. But you know, we all are on the same team in our shops, and so uh, I'll, I'll say two brains are better than one. Um, and so the, the the true key out of that is to really partner up with them and understand what it is that they want. Um, so I, I kind of go to this that when they're putting in requests for data or information or something, it's, it's absolutely key that, that you all understand not just that they want a list of donors or something, but what's, what's driving it, what's behind that. Um, we may think we know everything as fundraisers, but you guys know far more than we do as far as data and trends and that kind of stuff that are taking place with the system. Uh, similarly, I had a coworker of mine the other day sent me an email saying, oh, hey, Mike, I need some information on your donor database. Can you give me how many donors you have and how many are board members and how many are volunteers and how many are blood members, blood donors, and, and probably 50 different statistics in here that he wanted. And while I could have emailed him and said, oh, 18%, 212, 14, that sort of thing, I said, you know, can we line up a quick conversation and chat for a few minutes so I can understand what it is that you're looking for? And we probably spent 20, 30 minutes on the phone, and what he was doing was trying to set up a strategy for uh, planning for next year for, to steward their blood donors. And he wanted to know if there was any interconnectedness between the blood donors and the development side of the house. So, you know, praise him for thinking outside of just his own little division and department there and trying to look for any other ways that, that his blood donors were affiliated with the organization. Yet, really, he was just looking in his email for those statistics. So after that 20 or 30 minute conversation, we were able to sit down and once I understood what he wanted, start to think of some different ideas and strategies and things and came up with several other kind of key constituencies that he hadn't even thought about that will help us partner on events and all that sort of thing. So um, I, I, I really push for this understanding kind of the background of the request and that sort of thing that's taking place. Um, I think that's how you all could, could really benefit them in that, in that arena. Um, 
The next part will we'll break into two quick areas. So again, I don't know where everybody works and that kind of stuff, but we'll look at it for uh, really quickly as if I'm a fundraiser in the information that I'm looking for, and then as a development director, the, the information I'm looking for. So as a fundraiser, I'm looking for uh, two key pieces of information. So one is who's next, and then two, what do I do with this person? And, and while it doesn't seem like a, a data or information driving thing, what do I do with this person? Uh, you, you all have a lot in that area, a lot of influence there. And so we'll focus just on the first two of these five eyes. Does everyone know the five eyes of fundraising? So uh, identify them, inform them, uh, get them interested, then they get involved, and they contribute to the organization. And we'll focus on the first two eyes because I think the next three, the, the, the interest, involvement, and investment is truly the fundraiser's job is to get them pulled into the organization. Um, so the, the, the identify, we want to figure out who's next, who should I be focusing on. Um, so we'll toss this out to the group here under the identify. What kinds of things do you think of we could use to identify new prospects for the organization? This is like lobbing a softball. <laughs> Capacity. Capacity, brilliant. Past giving. What's that? Past giving. Past giving. Affinity to the organization. I, I wish we had a statistic on that. That'd be fantastic. Anybody else? Donations. Donations to the organization. Um, this is just a few. This list could go, we could spend all day just looking at this kind of a list. But. Family or philanthropic history. I worked at the Houston Symphony for a good number of years, and um, that's old family money, as you can imagine, down there in the South. And so some of those contributors to the organization have been giving for decades. And one of the donors I had that I worked with said he gave his first contribution to the Houston Symphony when he was 12. And it's because it just came through the generations, and they taught them that philanthropy at a young age. Giving history, we heard out there. Are there trends in their giving history? Is are they going up, down? Down's not as bad. It gives us a reason to talk to them. Any any kind of a hook that we have uh, that we can use to talk to them. Retention rates, all that good kind of stuff. The the giving level is a big thing. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody's in smaller shops. When when Duke University did their big billion dollar campaign, they hired a chemist to come in and tear apart the data. And what they were trying to do was profile major gift contributors, what made a major gift contributor, so that they can apply that to the people in their database and see who might be future major gift contributors. And what they found there was that the single largest clarifying factor is that somebody had made a single gift of $1,000 or more to their organization. So not your $100 a month people and that sort of thing, but somebody wrote a single gift of $1,000 meant they had the capacity to at least contribute $25,000 going forward and so it gave them a quick area to focus on. So we, as soon as we came in the blood center filter, who's giving us $1,000, hit the streets there and, and, and go follow those people. Um, event attendance, whether it's an event that you are producing or maybe it's benefiting your organization or on behalf of your organization, if they're coming, that's one of those affinity factors right there that you've got to know about. You've got to be tracking that kind of information because if they're coming through the door, those are obvious ones there. And I go back to those other six areas that, that the development team is focused on and, and the values, motivations. Do they fund organizations similar to yours or in the same region as yours and that sort of thing uh, can absolutely be, be prospects for the, for the organization. On to the, the second eye, the information side of the house. I go right back to these six pieces of information that help us. Um, you know, if, if you come with two prospects to an organization and, and bring them to me, for instance, and one of them's a CEO of a company and he's 65 with no kids and he's got a house in Whitney Island and he's got his own plane and boat, uh, the way that I'm going to approach that individual is completely different from the 60-year-old public educator who has three kids and two of them are in college and they've squirreled their money away and they live in Olympia. Those are completely different approaches, completely different conversations in there. And so the more information again that, that the research world can produce on this kind of stuff helps us with our approach and strategies with those people going forward. Any questions about it? On, as 
a development director side of the house, I'm, I'm really trying to pay attention to where are we, what's going on, what are the trends that are taking place. And whether it's donors, gifts, levels, attendance, hopefully our attendance each year is going up at our events and that sort of stuff. And, and so what I do is I, I have one, I'm lucky enough to have one data person on our team. And, and we sit down regularly and start looking at these sorts of things. And, I was just telling Jennifer earlier, our first three months this year, we were off like a rocket ship. Life is great. We've plateaued a little bit. We've slowed down. And so the first thing I do is grab that data person, sit down and say, what's happening at this level? Come help me figure this out. And we do spend quite a bit of time. And we kind of have our little rule of the, the three whys, so to speak. Why, why, why? So she may come in and sit down and say, hey, it's, it's uh, $500 giving level is down this year. Great, why? come back, think about that, and come back and say, oh, well, it looks like our direct mail results are down to this group. Great, why? And, and, and it's really that third why. Well, as we start to work together on this, in that first meeting, she's already taken it to that third why. Direct mail's down, and this is because, and, and so we kind of get to the, to the crux of what's taking place. Um, but, but we spend a little bit of time each month looking at all of these trends and doing our best to set up projections and things like that moving forward. <clears throat> the, the last piece I'll, I'll, I'll talk about really quick is on the delivery side of the house. Um, so like I said, it's, it's probably the most frustrating thing to provide information to people and it just sits there and nobody does anything with it. Um, and so that's, I, I think there's two reasons for that. One is it's not quite the right piece of information. So just because we as fundraisers say, hey, I need a list of donors. Great, you guys come and provide us with a list of donors, but maybe it's not quite what I was looking for, and, and I may not know enough to, to ask specifically for it. And second, it could be on the delivery side of the house. So if it's just an Excel spreadsheet, great. I'm gonna file it away. My plan is to get to it in the next two weeks, which turns to four weeks, which turns to six weeks from now. There was a conference I went to a number of years ago, and the, the, the speaker that was up there was an MD, MBA. And for his thesis, what he did is he, he wanted to, he, he had heard a lot about how difficult it is for fundraisers to work with physicians. And they, they just, they don't get it. They don't understand what I'm telling them. So he did this test and he put 100 MDs in a room and he gave them a little bit of information and he said, it's your job to come up with a creative company. You've got three hours, so it doesn't need to be massively detailed. But you've got three hours, I need you to come up with a name for the company, a mission statement, business plan, budget, that sort of thing. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. You've got to do this all on your own, and I'll be back at noon. And he walks out the room and shuts the door, and he peeks in through the window, and he sees, anybody guess what the MDs did? They all just, as soon as the door shut, they do this. And they scroll down, and they start writing, i got three hours, i got to hurry, i got to go. And they're looking around. And the reason is, <laughs> These people, since they were this age, knew they were going to be a doctor. And they had to be the best in grade school, and they had to get the best grades in high school so they could get to the right medical schools, residency, fellowship, blah, blah, blah. But it was all about them, all about them being the best, and not about anybody else. So he does the same thing with 100 MBA grads. and puts them in the room, same spiel, here's the information, mission statement, budget, all that good kind of stuff. Don't talk with anybody. It's all on your own. I'll be back in three hours. He shuts the door and he appears in there. And the first thing that happened in that room is they start partnering up three, four at a time. All right, all right, you're on mission, you're on budget, you're on this. I'll do PR, we'll meet back in an hour. And they, they divided and conquered in there. And it wasn't, the point of the story wasn't that the MBA people are better at working with people than the, than the MDs, so to speak. But it was that the, the MDs have been trained to think statistics, facts, figures, this medication does this, this is how you apply this. And here we are, our lovely development people. We're people people, we like to talk, we're all about relationships and conversations and details. So we're working with these docs coming in saying, hey, it'd be great if you met with Bob, because Bob really likes you, he likes your kids, and it would really help us go forward. And, and we're just, we're not registering with them. But if we were to come at them with, Okay, it takes three or four prospects for each gift. Here's the prospects we have, and start to show them statistically how this works. 
and kind of the ROI on their time and how important that is, that would start to resonate with them. And, and I mean, uh, we took that right back and started to apply that to see if we could gain any ground there. And so the reason I tell this long-winded story is it's almost a 180 of what we have here. So you all are the information gurus and you have your spreadsheets and information and data and all this good kind of stuff. And we're the people people. We're all about relationships and conversations, not to mention we think we know it all. And so if there's a way for you all to help deliver that information that might resonate better with us, that, that could certainly benefit both sides of the house. And so I'm sure everybody's seen this, the, 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 the typical donor cultivation cycle that, that goes back around. And you know, bare minimum, think of something in, in this sort of a manner that if you're bringing prospects to them, this is what's going on in our head as fundraisers. So if you can start to think about how to deliver that to us and say, hey, I think this might help us identify these eight prospects. Or here's some information on family career motivations, I think, that could help you with these six people in your cultivation or stewardship with them. And, and deliver that in a fashion of what our minds are thinking with these people. There might be a better connection between some of the best medical advances out there are because uh, engineers have followed around physicians or clinicians and have watched them what they do each day inside and out and they've, they've been able to pick up on some inefficiencies and, and redundancies and things of what they do and so these engineers can come through and see it in a different light and say well well, you need a tool that does this, or why do you do this, or you can skip this step and move to here. And so I, I kind of think about that in the same manner as more heads are better than one, but if you all can bring your expertise into what we're thinking and, and how we think about it and apply that, um, I think that's what we'll get the best in all of that next time. So that's all I have. One half hour quick ramble. So lots of time for questions and things if hopefully anybody has. Anybody? Yeah. The brave soul. Could you uh, expand on the advisors area? Exactly what that's. Oh, those six? Yeah. Advisors area. So I'll just run through them real quick. So family, family, right? Kids, spouse, grandchildren, etc. Values. Politically, religiously, what are the values there? That helps us start to steer our conversations one way or another. One time when I was at the symphony, we had lined up our CEO with a great dinner of 12 women, and they all had a great evening after the concert. Dinner lasted about two hours, and she came in the next day and said the first hour and 55 minutes was the best dinner they've ever had. They had a blast. One of the women there, her husband was running for mayor, and the vote was in a week, and so on the way, as they're wrapping up dinner, she said, hey, tell them good luck next Tuesday. And one of the other women there said, whoa, why would you say something like that? And then all of a sudden, the whole table just erupted, because you, you, some are on one side of the, of the coin and some are the, on the other side of the coin. So any kind of information there that we know about what their true values are helps us career. What have they done? What has a spouse done for their lives? High olds and that sort of thing certainly help advisors. Do they have financial advisors? Uh, do they have attorneys that help them with plan giving stuff? If somebody has a financial advisor, a financial advisor's job in the world is to manage money. And here comes Mike coming and saying, I want some of that money. And so that financial advisor is going to do what? Obviously what the client wants, but that process is going to be slowed down quite a bit with that person in there. Uh, some families tr uh, truly involve their children and that sort of thing in their processes. And it's a, it's a family philanthropy. So any of that kind of stuff we put in advisors, who do they seek counsel from? regarding any kind of financial decisions. Um, assets, no brand, they have houses, cars, vacation homes, et cetera, and then, and then motivations. Um, do they want to benefit the community? Do they love education? Do they support organizations along those lines? All that kind of information helps us set up those strategies. <coughs> yes? As somebody new to the world here and new to the role, I'm, I'm uh, in a situation with death by user as well, so I'm curious to get a little more detail about your strategy and how you actually executed the pulling the plug on the prior user codes and implementing the new ones. Guidance, best practices. Guidance, best practices. I haven't used Razor's Edge before, 
so I, I grabbed somebody at the at the uh, uh, Woodland Park Zoo because they're on Razor's Edge. The Fred Hutch was on the zoo, and and we met with their their data people to come in and talk to them and about their best practices and what they've seen. So I could come in saying, here's my vision, and here's my thought, and here's what I want. How are you guys using this system? Where are your codes? And, and they're different, but it, it, it helped guide us through kind of the best practices, so to speak. We can take the best from the hutch and the best from the zoo and, and apply those sorts of things in our database. Is that what you were looking for? Sure. I think way too many meetings, way too much time spent on, <laughs> on that kind of detail. But it's important. I mean, it, it really has helped streamline our processes. Uh, you give a sense of the like, number of reports or what those specific reports are that you ask your dad person for to give you this information? Um, yes, we try and keep it um, really simplified and, and uh, we are admin heavy at the Blood Center. We love our reports and our processes we're really trying to streamline that now. So it's taken a bit of time, but we work with the board and the development committee and then the CEO and, uh, and my team to come up with one monthly report that will satisfy everybody um, so that we don't, uh, you know, when I was at Symphony, we had separate reports for the development director, separate reports for the board, separate for the development committee, all do every month, and they're all in different formats. That's a complete waste of time and effort. Anyway. So we have one, it's a six-page monthly report, but it shows us trends and it breaks out corporate, including proposals that are there, um, what's in the pipeline, visit counts, all that kind of stuff. Same thing for foundations, individuals, and events. And so that's that's how we've looked at that sort of stuff. And so it gets detail into each one of those. And then each staff member does their own reports. Um, and then the, the good thing for the blood center is we have 300,000 blood donors. Uh, so we have a long list of prospects. So we, we did a big rating thing there, and then the, my data person and I sit down and look at the monthly report and the trends that are happening there, and then kind of who's next on that list, what are the eight or ten prospects that are doing there. So we try and not bottle ourselves down with too much information, but just enough to kind of help get us in there. So it's, it's pretty minimal at the moment. So we spend more time working on those donor strategy sheets than do analytical reports systems. Yes. So um, I work in an organization that has development front frontline development officers that range from people who say I just need a name and a phone number to people who say I need to know absolutely everything, including the dog's name, and then I still might not call. So how can we manage up through our uh, director to help sort of funnel to the middle of that, I'm a prospect researcher, you know, I'm really happy with the person who just wants the name and the phone number. Of course. <laughs> and, and he calls, and I'm, <laughs> you know, frustrated with the person who wants tons and tons and tons of information and still doesn't take action. So how can we use someone like you to... Kick them in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, you know, any kind, any way you can start to get the dialogue this way, I think, <laughs> helps. So if there's any way to do any kind of a, I don't know, how big is the development team? Big. Big, big. Any, kind, any way you can get any kind of cross-training in there going on, but I think that's a great conversation for you to have with the development mm -hmm. director, uh, whoever's running the show there, and, and see if you can get a person who needs a name and a number and makes that cold call to that doctor in California, right. to the person that you give full biographical information for and they don't move and, and help to get that training going across. But if the person at the top's not driving those <coughs> expectations and things coming down, then then you're not going to get anywhere, I don't think. And, and you know, it, uh, it doesn't have to be anything more than this stuff. And that's that whole, what is it, via paralysis? What is that? You guys know that? Analysis. Analysis via, yeah, through paralysis. That's, it, it, you know, if they're married, if they have kids, a couple of homes, if I know that kind of stuff, then, then that, that should help us start to drive that. I think it's probably more with the fundraiser and the cells and how comfortable they are with it. But, and maybe it's just you and those two to start having those conversations. So my point is, my question is actually very similar in that, you know, how do you take the, the data and get it to the, the story 
And I mean, is it just that sheet that you have that kind of illustrates? Or, you know, when I think data, I'm usually thinking codes and things like that. I'm not necessarily thinking, you know, big text blocks about, you know, who they're. But, but I think that a lot of people, you know, I could, I could say, okay, here's Michael Cheever, and he has kid one, two, and three. Or I could write out, Michael Cheever is a father of three. And you, know, <laughs> and, you know, and I know that there are some people who would process that story better than if I were to list, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. And, and so and I'm just wondering, like, how? Thankfully, I'm not a father of three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we have in our system is, is these. So we, we have this in our notes section of Razor's Edge. We're, we're allowed six notes in Razor's Edge. So that's it. And so the idea is there's the family note, and then there's bullets underneath the family note. There's values, and there's bullets underneath the value. And if I go out and talk with somebody, and I come back, and I found out, maybe we knew they had three grandchildren, but I came out and found their names were Ann, Beth, and Tom. I don't go in and add a new code, and add a new note, and do all that sort of thing. I go into the current note that we have, and I just add a couple of bullets under the grandchildren and go, oh, it's Ann, Beth, and Tom. So all I'm doing is adding a little bit more information to the bullets that exist, not paragraphs of Tom likes to play with blocks and he's a great kid and he reads three grades of them in school. Uh, so it's just very quick. And the idea is we have these, these the, the, you know, the one flaw we have right now is we have the donor worksheets that I showed and we're entering this stuff in the system and we quite, haven't quite, maybe I should talk to you all. <laughs> how to sync those things up and, and remove that one that one step that we have in there. Uh, but that's all we do. So we don't need the stories and that kind of thing. You know, we want to focus your time and energy on what's going to be beneficial. And while the story would be great, it's it's really just that information that's there. So our job is just to go out, find more of that information, and just update those bullets. Because when we run our uh, donor profile reports, these six pieces show up with giving history and things. And then we know it's really easy, succinct, and we know what we have in front of us and not note, 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 note through pages of trying to update that information. So bullets, I think, are far better than the stories in this So how do you make the transformation since uh, as a blood donor, I am donating to you Excellent. my blood? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't. That's a separate system, but um, unfortunately, we, we, we don't have a central CRM or anything at the blood center, which is, makes things challenging. Um, but what we did is, is we went and rated 100,000 of the blood donors. We have that in a separate access database. We took a percentage of them and the ones that we were putting in our fundraiser portfolios, and those are the ones that we added into Razor's Edge, because I didn't want to create 100,000 records in Razor's Edge that we're not going to use. So it's just the ones that are in the portfolio so that we can manage our efforts with, with those people there. Yeah. So you could like target analytics or something like that? Or the, or the Would we use Wealth Engine? Wealth well, Engine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As the development director of the Blood Center, do you go in and do a lot of these things you're talking about in Razor's Edge? And oh, absolutely. You go Absolutely. Do you see that as essential, especially if you're in a small group? Because I have some development people that don't. They see me <laughs> as the person. <coughs> I'm just curious. I mean, because at your level, it's, uh, I guess it's ex nice to Expectations hear. for everybody. Our CEO has his own portfolio, and obviously I'm providing him with all the spreadsheet yeah. or, or strategy worksheets right. and information and next steps, and he's got to go do them. And then his assistant and I, we're still trying to figure that piece right. out of how to get that information in. But top to bottom, we're all responsible for doing that kind of stuff. And yeah. not just giving it to the data people to put into Razor's Edge. No, no, and I'm going to know things I think that may be more pertinent in my relationship with this person right. than just. And I found also that I, I know a lot of people who do that. And they're like, here's the report. Can you enter that in Razor's right. Edge? And by the time they got done writing the report, they could have put that in the Razor's yes. Edge themselves. Thank so. you. <laughs> I've said, I know, I've said that, but it doesn't seem to translate sometimes to yeah, the development people that if you just, 
you know, the time we sit for you to give me all these notes and for me to write them down and then go back to my computer and type I, them all in. You, know, you one could thing, have done it. One thing at the Blood Center, we spend a little, have spent a lot, the development office, I think, has spent a lot of time and energy helping a lot of people do a lot of things. Um, but the more time we help and do all that kind of stuff, the less time we're spent on fundraising. So as I've been there, we're really trying to chunk this stuff off and say, is this helping us get to raising our $100 million, yes or no, no, then that's probably not the best use. I mean, I, I really could have approached it that way with them and say, okay. this probably isn't the best use of my time. I can help find the next big prospects or something. Right. Okay. But, I mean, that option has to come from the top. Yeah. And I've seen shops where they are like, my fundraisers are good people people, and I want to make sure they have enough admin support to get their content reports in. I, you know, I mean, I tend to be a you-should-do-it-yourself person, but I've seen it go various ways. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the, 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 the magic wand to wave there. I really just... Uh, I, again, by the time they get done writing all that stuff to tell the person to write all of this in the system, they could have had it done themselves. And so, uh, you know, I've seen that in a number of shops, and it is, it's really helping them manage. Some of that may be, I've run into this a lot of fundraisers who've never managed people before or managed admin staff. And so, you know, if you can help show them, here's what this person could do for you, you prep lead letters or pull some of this information and do research on this person and that person rather than writing the contact report so that the, the admin person is helping them with the next step, so to speak. And that goes all the way down to training, too. If you have an admin person you're saying, here's the report, enter that in the system to go, they're not going to learn anything. So if you can have them starting to think about that donor cultivation stop, uh, cycle and those next steps, that starts to help them prep for the next step in their career to be doing fundraising for Any questions? Yeah. Yes? You mentioned that you and your data person meet regularly to figure out the lines. Um, so you, you come out of those meetings with like, theories, um, but I think I think probably a lot of people in this profession do, do the reports and then they they leave the analysis to the, the fundraiser. Um, can you talk about maybe the benefits of, that have come from the approach of like, working directly? Again, we fundraisers think we know it all and can do it all. And, and, and uh, But I, I keep going back to that two heads are better than one. And it's, and it's there will be ideas and creativity and thoughts in that analysis coming from somebody else. And it probably happens every single day in our office. So I'm like, well, maybe it's because of that. So it's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Because, you know, we, we grow up and we have our career paths and, and, and our experiences, and, and this is us. Well, this is somebody else, and this is somebody else. So they're bringing that other experience in. So there's not a time, not a single meeting where we have met that we haven't come back with next steps out of there regarding some analysis or thoughts or, That's or kind detail. That's kind of that usually, like, usually um, like you want to report and discuss it with you know like, and theorize like oh why are why is this kidney vehicle down like usually it's like oh maybe it's resurfacing in another place so like you have to get the follow up reports on that. Um, and do you, do you there, there there's a balance. You don't want to just keep chasing the annual giving response device yeah. and spend six months at why did it not perform quite in the same way. You know, yeah. you do want to keep thinking bigger and better and that sort of thing. But we, we all we always have our agendas and at the bottom are the open remaining issues of the things that we haven't solved from the last meeting. So they're always on that agenda and we keep coming back to those of making sure that we move that dial a little bit. But I used to work arm in arm with Jennifer and, and uh, fantastic conversations from the data side of the house and the development side that sharp person and, and she's bringing a whole new perspective to these conversations about well what if I gave you this with this help or would you rather see this with this help and, and those just they spark a lot of creativity and, and it's good for both sides to be very instrumental. Yeah. Now is more than ever additional sources of information are available that are outside of our CRMs. What are your thoughts on 
the LinkedIn data, the Facebook data, how that's going to play itself out in the future, especially as it relates to your role. Research, obviously, those folks will play a, a key role in that, but as more and more of this data becomes readily available for us to consume and sink into our systems, where do you see that going? Is it playing a role in your work or not, or what? The, the one person in the country who's not on Facebook, so <laughs> <laughs> you know where I lie on that side. Uh, yeah, we're full bore with, with the blood center and Facebook and that sort of thing. I, you know, there's 2,000 social networking sites out there and all this information, LinkedIn and things like that, and it's and it's it's that paralysis again. There's so much we could spend all day trying to find every little bit of detail, but I, I, I really try and bring it down to the what's it going to take for us to do our jobs? What's the core pieces of information that we need? And if it's and if it's beyond this, and somebody in my group is has this information, is it moving? Then we're going to have those conversations of why do you need to know that they went to this prep school when they were a kid? And that doesn't really pertain to what we're doing here. And, and, and so I, that mixed with who knows? I mean, it's it's rather new in the world of philanthropy, and we're not sure if any of that social networking is going to pay off down the road and, and turn into true to true contributions to the nonprofits. But kind of. When in doubt, we, we stop and, and, and try and pull ourselves back on track and, and focus to these areas here. So 20 years from now, could be something totally different. Anybody else? Any other questions? Well, before we give Mike a nice form of applause, there is on the desk in front of you a sheet, an evaluation sheet, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill that out before we file out of here for lunch. I think that I speak on behalf of everyone in this room as a data person. Wouldn't it be nice to have fundraisers like him that have around every day to make our lives a lot easier? Mike, thank you so much. Thank you.